Welcome back to Physics This Week. I'm Trevor, and today let's talk about uh, a damped harmonic oscillator. By the end of today, we're going to show you the uh, equation of motion for a damped harmonic oscillator. We're going to see what the, the motion looks like, and we're going to take a look at a quantity called the damping ratio, which tells us how well this thing oscillates. Okay, so let's set up the equations of motion for this, and in order to do that, we're going to have to set up the free body diagrams. So let's start out with a spring hanging from a fixed support. If this thing happens to be at equilibrium, then the spring force points in the upwards direction. Of course, the gravitational force points in the downwards direction. And by definition, because it's at equilibrium, those two forces are equal to each other. If we move it away from equilibrium, we do something like pull it down and let it go, it's going to oscillate back and forth around equilibrium. At any particular point, the spring force and the gravitational force will not be equal, and it's the difference between those two that acts as the restoring force. And I'm leaving a little bit of room here because I'm going to add a few more forces in here. I'm actually going to fill up a cup with water and I'm going to let this thing oscillate back and forth in there. When I do this, there will be a small buoyant force. That buoyant force will depend on the density of the bob you have in here. If you do this with a ping pong ball, this thing, of course, will float and we won't have the situation that we want. Typically, we use a metal or a, some type of a heavy, um, more dense than water uh, spring mass in here. In that case, uh, that buoyant force will be very small, in fact. There's one other force that's acting. It's called the damping force. And it's called the damping force because the original studies of this were actually done in liquids, and that would make things damp. So damping has come to mean this behavior, in particular, when the damping force is linearly related to the velocity. Of course, it points in the opposite direction because if you're moving forward, the damping force acts as a resistance in the opposite direction, but it's a linear type of relationship. If this is a squared relationship between the, uh, the force and the square of the velocity, then the mathematics gets a lot more complicated, and in fact, that doesn't match up with most physical systems that we would ever take a look at here. Now, something to remember is that buoyant force, as I said, is nearly equal at all points, unless you have something that's oscillating through a very large uh, depth. In that case, the buoyant force could change. And of course, the gravitational force is equal at all points. So what that's going to do is it's actually going to shift this equilibrium point just a little bit, either up or down, depending on the size of the buoyant force. But because it's nearly equal, we can use that same trick that we used with the regular spring system. And it turns out that the net spring force measured around that new equilibrium and the damping force are the only two that act. So we can just build our free body diagram around those two forces. So as always, we're going to start from Newton's second law. We're going to throw in those two forces that are acting, the net spring force and the damping force. I'm going to rewrite those uh, with smaller subscripts so it's a little easier to carry around. And then I'm going to put in the actual values for those, turn this uh, vector equation into an algebra equation with the negative signs denoting the, the directions. And of course, I, as always, I leave the A to float. It has no sign to it. It's going to pick up the sign depending on the relation between these two quantities. I rearrange this just a little bit. And now I realize that this is actually a differential equation because the acceleration is the second derivative with respect to time of x. V is the first derivative with respect to time. And of course, the kx just stays as it is. Divide both sides by m. I'm going to define these two variables. Omega is very familiar. We've seen that before. That's the square root of k over m. 
So this term is going to look like omega squared. And I also define this term called gamma, which is related to uh, the damping force or damping constant, excuse me, over m. But I throw in this factor of 2 to make the math work out a little bit better later on. So that's a trick that you wouldn't necessarily know of, but people who have done this for a long time have figured out that that's handy to do. So I put those guys in. I get this type of equation, and we're going to work on the solution from there. If we take a look at the solution to this, I've highlighted a few things here, and what I want to point out is if we want to solve this, we do what's called an auxiliary equation or a characteristic equation, and we call that x is equal to e lambda theta or lambda t. Lambda is going to be related to these other constants that we have up above, but it, this is kind of a mathematical trick that you learn in differential equations that will help us get to a solution for this. So the equation above has uh, derivatives with respect to time, so let's take those derivatives. Remember when you take e to the something, you pull the something down out front using the chain rule. When you take the second derivative, you have to do that again, and we get these three bits. So if we throw those bits into the original equation up here, we get something that has gotten rid of those. And each term actually has this e to the lambda t. So we're going to cancel that out on both sides of the equation. We now have an equation that is a polynomial, order 2, looks like the standard form. So we can use the quadratic equation. And when we do that, we see that we can uh, put all the pieces in. We get our squares in the right place. We can pull this factor of 2 out. Notice if we hadn't put that factor of 2 in gamma, we wouldn't have it here. And we wouldn't have it here with the 4 so that we could pull this out. That's really just foreshadowing. Uh, somebody had done this before, realized they could make the math look a little bit easier. So we put that uh, 2 into the definition of gamma right from the beginning. We then can factor out all these twos or divide them through, and we get a much simpler looking expression. And one thing that is not immediately obvious at this point, but if you actually ever set one of these up and work with it, it turns out that gamma is almost universally smaller than omega. That means that this term underneath the, the radical is actually negative taking the square root of a negative, we end up getting an i that comes out of there because this term, uh, as written here, is imaginary. And here we just make it look uh, you know, like we can see that it's definitely imaginary by having that term in there. So remember that quadratic has two roots in it. That's why we have the plus and minus uh, in it all the way down through. So we get the positive root looks like that with the plus sign. The negative root looks very similar. We just throw the negative sign into there. And we could put either one of those back into that characteristic equation. Or one of the things you learn in differential equations is that if you have one solution and you have a second solution, a linear combination of those solutions will get you the general solution. So the general solution is a combination, a linear combination in particular, of these two guys. The a and the b here are the factors that you put in uh, to make all the possible solutions uh, that are available. So for example, uh, a could be 0, b could be 1. Then we get uh, situations that look like this up above. Uh, or uh, we can make different combinations of that general solution. OK, so we're going to take that general solution, going to factor out that e to the negative now gamma t. And then there are a couple of tricks that we can do here with these guys. Um, we're going to combine those exponential terms. 
the amplitude comes out from that. It's some combination of these two guys with these guys put together. And we're going to use the fact that e to the i theta is equal to um, cosine theta plus i sine theta. And with a little bit of playing around, we find out that we can rewrite this as just a pure cosine function with a phase angle um, that varies depending on where we start our clock relative to where the spring is in its motion. And we also finally define this omega primed to be omega squared minus gamma squared. That makes this equation look a little bit neater. We don't have to carry around this guy. We calculate this, we throw it into the equation, and then we go from there. So this equation looks a little bit easier to work with than the equivalent equation that was written up at the top. Again, making clever use of uh, a few definitions. So let's take a look at the individual parts of these. So the A is the maximum displacement of the pendulum bob. And I have that in here as one. E to the lambda theta, or excuse me, gamma theta, gamma t, excuse me, is this function that comes out. What this is doing is it's showing the damping of the motion. Next, we take a look at this part in blue. That's the oscillation contribution. If we had no damping at all, that would uh, look like a pure cosine function. As time goes on, you can see the multiplication of these two terms causes the displacement of the object to become smaller and smaller as time goes on. That's the damping uh, of this motion. Finally, let's take a look at this term, omega primed, which we define to be the damping frequency. Typically, the value for gamma is much smaller than omega, so there's not a big change in the frequency. But if you do a proper fit on this data, you will see a slight change in that frequency. Now let's take a look at this uh, amount of damping that we have. Again, remember, omega primed is equal to omega squared minus omega. A lot of times we define a number gamma that's called the damping constant, which is just the ratio of gamma to omega. And you can go through the definitions of those guys. Uh, and a lot of times you will see people just define gamma this way, but it's really coming back from the ratio of the two terms under the radical here. So let's map these out and see how the damping coefficient uh, affects this. So if you have a very, if you have a ratio of one, this harmonic oscillator actually won't oscillate and it's going to go down to zero essentially as quickly as it possibly can. If you have a value different than that, then this term is actually going to oscillate, but it's going to oscillate just a little bit. So I'm reducing this uh, damping coefficient as I work my way down, or damping ratio, excuse me. And you can see there, as I make it smaller and smaller, this oscillation gets bigger and bigger. It goes more times before it dies out. And again, making this even smaller, you can see this number gets uh, even smaller as you go. Uh, so that the damping is much less, you get larger uh, oscillations for a longer period of time. Okay, so a quick review of what we've talked about here. In order to figure out the damping coefficient and the damping equation of motion, we had to start out with two forces acting, the net spring force and the damping force. Together, those gave us uh, the mass times the acceleration according to Newton's second law. The damping force is some constant times the velocity. It goes in the opposite direction to the velocity. And in most cases that are actually physical that we want to be able to look at, we have a linear relationship between those two. We put together the equation of motion and doing a little bit of differential equations with that, 
after defining a few simple uh, variables to make things look a little bit neater, we end up with an equation of motion that looks like this, where this term underneath is defined to be omega primed, looking like uh, the difference between omega and gamma with the squares and then take the square root. And we can also have this damping coefficient that tells us how quickly this thing uh, actually goes to zero oscillations. With a ratio of about one, this goes quickly to uh, equilibrium. With smaller and smaller damping coefficients, you get these oscillations continuing for a longer time. Thanks for stopping by today. I hope this is helpful. And remember, you can always find us at uh, physicsthisweek.com.